Good morning, everybody. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jean Tirol. Um, just for a brief introduction, uh, Jean is the uh, honorary chairman of the Jean-Jacques Lafont uh, Toulouse School of Economics Foundation and the chairman of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Toulouse. Uh, he's also affiliated with MIT, where he holds a visiting position, uh, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales and the Institut de France. So Professor Tyrol's research covers uh, industrial organization, regulation, finance, macroeconomics and banking, and psychology-based economics. I was wondering whether it would be the quicker to tell you what it doesn't cover, actually. Um, Jean has published over 200 articles in international reviews, uh, 12 scientific books, which are referenced in their respective areas of study. So he's a laureate of numerous international distinctions, as you know, uh, including the 2007 CNRS Gold Medal, and the 2014 Sveriges Risk Bank Prize in Economic Science in memory of Alfred Nobel. So we are really delighted that Jean accepted to talk today on challenges for businesses and society in the digital age. Please join me in welcoming Jean Tirol. Good, good morning, uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, and thank you all for being here, and congratulations also for being here. Uh, so I have an half an hour, and then we'll have a discussion. So I would like to uh, talk about uh, some of the challenges, focusing on two, competition policy and data. Uh, this being said, there are so many, uh, so many uh, challenges, including uh, work, labor, uh, taxation, uh, industrial policy, and so on. I'm going to go very fast, very, very fast. You are all experts in the first slides uh, because it's about motivating why we need new competition policy. Um, today, we, uh, we have a lot of, of uh, natural monopolies and, uh, because there are network societies, direct or indirect net network societies, and we don't like monopolies, right? We don't like monopolies not only because they tend to charge high prices, and they do, by the way. It's not because we consumers get zero prices that uh, the prices are not high. I mean, it's just thinking about the other side of the market, which is going to pass through all the costs into your prices. Uh, but also because monopolies tend not to innovate. Uh, they don't innovate because they don't have, they are not spurred by competition. You know, they, 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 they don't want to cannibalize their own products and also there is no good benchmark for their managers, so monopolies is not, is not that great. At the same time, they are efficient because of the network societies, right? I'm on Facebook not necessarily because Facebook is so efficient, but just because you are on Facebook, so it's, it's actually nice to be on the same network. So let me skip all those introduction slides that you, you know quite well, and let me start uh, by the following questions. Nowadays, as, as you know, there is a tech clash. Lots of uh, politicians, regulators, intellectuals are calling for public utility regulation or divestiture breakups or tough antitrust, or like in Europe, industrial policy. I'm not going to discuss all of that, but let me just tell you right away that I don't think that all style public utility regulation is going to fly for two reasons. The first is that we don't follow the firms along the life cycle. And it's not an electricity company, it's not a telephone company or a railroad company. Um, it's a company which has succeeded against you know, many other companies, so we didn't follow Google, and we don't have any estimate of the probability of success in that industry. The other thing is that unlike the railroad companies or the electricity companies or the telecom companies, all those firms are global. So who is going to regulate them? So you have multiple regulators and you know, there is a lack of coordination and, and the accounting is, is very, very poor. So let me rule this out. Talk a little bit about a structural policy like breakups. Uh, for example, Eliz Elizabeth Warren has proposed breakups. Uh, after all, we, in some countries, we have broken up uh, electricity companies uh, or railroad companies, finding what the essential facility was so that part of the infrastructure that cannot be easily duplicated, like high voltage transmission grid or uh, railroad tracks and stations. Um, and once you have identified that, you are going to put them aside, and then you 
have potential competition if there is fair access. There is potential competition on the complementary segments. Um, so if we want to do that with Google and Facebook and others, what we have to do is apply the essential facility doctrine and find out what, what is the essential facility. And that's where it gets a little bit more difficult for a couple of reasons. The first is that those technologies are changing all the time. I know offense to people who work in electricity, telecom, and, and railroads, but you know, the technology has, has not changed for 100 years. I mean, telecom has changed after the, the period of the AT&T breakup, but you know, by and large, you know, high voltage transmission grids and tracks and stations have been around for I don't know how many decades. So, you know, it's pretty easy, the technology doesn't change. When the technology changes, that's a different ball game. Because it takes time to divest, and you know, if the essential facility has changed in five, changes in five years from now, you have to do it all over again. The other thing is that you have to define what's the essential facility. And uh, by the way, I'm not against that solution at all. It's fine, intellectually. What I want to see is a plan, something concrete. And you know, if I think about it, just think about Google. What is the essential facility? Is that search? Is that data? But then data, for example, is obtained by um, collecting data from, from multiple services, complementary services. And search is made better by actually data from other services. So you have to disentangle all those things. And the last point I want to make is that it's easier to, un to prohibit a merger than undoing it. Once the eggs have been scrambled, it's very hard to unscramble them. So you have to take that into account. So intellectually, it's a perfectly fine solution. But you need a clear plan on how you're going to do it. That's what I, I want to say. Before I have a plan, I will say comp competition policy and consumer protection are the main gains in town. But they are very imperfect. And for competition policy, very slow. So you must adapt the, 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 the policy infrastructure and policies to adjust to a fast-changing world. So I have some views about that. I won't have time to cover. We can discuss that in, in, in the Q&A part. But uh, I'm going to discuss a few topics um, about the dominant platforms. I'm going to talk about fair access. But I also want to emphasize the importance of multi-homing. The ability for, say, for example, the, the sellers or the business users to connect to multiple platforms and not be imposed upon an exclusivity contract. Just take an example. You have Uber and Lyft, ride-hailing platforms in the US. Imagine that Uber says, my drivers must be exclusive to me and cannot work with Lyft. Then the drivers have to choose a platform. Which platform do you choose? The biggest one, right? You want customers. And then nobody is going to work for Lyft. And no customers are going to use Lyft either anyway. So ability to multi-home is actually key to competition. Otherwise, incumbents will have with a, we'll have a field there. And I'll talk a bit uh, about other things as well. We economists, we talk about contestability. And if you talk to the gaffers, they will tell you that it's fine, there is competition, perhaps competition in the market is not that strong, but you have competition for the market. So, Google and Facebook are threatened by the next entrant. And that very competition actually forcing, forces them to be on their toes, to be agile. So I told you that monopolists don't innovate. But of course, if you are worried about being displaced by the new entrant, you have to innovate. I told you about high prices. However, if you don't want to have entry, you may want to build network externalities by charging low prices. And actually, there are 
there is some theoretical work, and <laughs> there is a paper of, of mine with Drew Fullenberg on exactly that point, which is that if an efficient entrant can enter and does enter, which is not the same, then a monopoly is not that bad because that monopoly will innovate and charge low prices. However, the if is very strong, and I want to insist on that. So in theory, yes, contestability might do the job. Competition for the market as opposed to competition in the market. But don't forget that requires very strong assumptions. So first, an efficient entrant must be able to enter. And this efficient entrant must be able to enter in general in a niche market. And Google started with just search. Amazon was selling books on, online, right? On a very small segment. And then they became, of course, multi-product uh, giants. So it's too costly to enter multiple segments at the same time. So what you have to do first is to enter a segment which you are good at. But for that, it must be the case that the entrant doesn't, doesn't actually prevent you from entering. Platforms operate markets and they also compete in them. So if you think about Amazon, for example, it's a marketplace, but there's also Amazon Basics or All Foods, uh, Apple with the apps and so on. Um, and what may happen is a dominant firm may create market power for the in-house complementers. Uh, that's unfair competition. You may have preferences for our own services and possibly predation as well, so uh, having very low prices. So there's a question of monitoring fair access. That's a little bit what the European Union has been doing. Um, so that that's raises some issues. Do you want to require a spin-off of private labels? Uh, and then, of course, just add lines of business res restriction to avoid re-entry. I don't know, it's complicated, but we have to, to be worried about that. But even if you succeed in letting the efficient entrants enter, they may not enter. They may not enter because it may be more profitable actually to sell out to the incumbent. And that's something you have to keep in mind. Um, both in tech and in the pharmaceutical industry, there have been lots of purchases by incumbents of startups and so on. So, for example, there is now evidence that pharmaceutical companies buy some molecules which will have competed with their molecule and basically kill them. Those are called killer acquisition. Okay? Um, and, you know, if you think about Facebook uh, purchase of Instagram and WhatsApp, you are kind of nervous because Instagram and WhatsApp were not really competing with Facebook, but they, of course they, uh, they were potential competitors being uh, social networks. Now, now, nowadays it's very difficult for a competition authority actually to go after those mergers, to challenge those mergers because you need evidence. You need evidence and of course this evidence is not there. You know, the, the, uh, the pharmaceutical startup, the biotech startup, hasn't even sold the molecule. Often it hasn't met the FDA test, actually. So there's no econometrics you can use to actually challenge a merger. It's just totally impossible. Um, and, and we are worried about that. Um, I mentioned here on the slide actually another prime, which is that it's also going to change. First, there is a very strong encouragement now for incumbents to buy the firms very early in the process, before there is any evidence of competition. So there is preemption game, preemption vis-a-vis -vis the regulator, and there is also an incentive for startups to actually engage in me to innovation, and then be purchased by the, by the incumbents. The social value of that is almost zero. Consumers don't benefit. It's just basically the startups blackmailing the incumbent and say, buy me, otherwise I will compete with you. This is bad. Now, the proposal, I think, will be to uh, reverse the burden of proof. So basically, ask the incumbent to prove that actually it's a pro-quantitative merger um, instead of the reverse, okay? At least when 
you know, the incumbent is actually the domi when the when the purchaser is the dominant firm in the indus industry, uh, it's at an early stage. Um, that re requires a lot of trust in the antitrust authorities, and that's one more reason why we need talented people and independent people. Um, let me mention now two issues you are familiar with, but just to remind you of, of some of the issues there. One issue which has arisen in the US is common ownership uh, by institutional investors. Um, asset managers, mutual funds, and so on. So if you look at some industries in the US, like airlines um, or banking and so on, which are oligopolies, uh, that tend to be owned mainly by Fidelity and BlackRock and State Street and Berkshire Hathaway and so on. It's common ownership of rivals. Um, and that's, that's an issue because the, those uh, institutional investors are also active investors, which, by the way, is a good thing, per se. It's a very good thing. However, you know, they can intervene. They can, for example, tell United Airlines, don't enter the routes of American Airlines. Don't compete. They can go for absolute performance evaluation as opposed to relative performance evaluation. You know, based on benchmarking with other firms in the same sector, simply because you know, relative performance evaluation makes managers more aggressive toward their rivals, and so on and so forth. You know, I can give you thousands of examples. So, at the same time, you don't want to kill this innovation. People have been searching for low-cost, uh, diversified savings, and you also want to have active investors. Now, do you have to change the law? And that's a more general theme and not specific to that one. We have been having laws since 1890 on the topic, so it's not new. You don't have to change the law. What you have to do is to produce guidelines. You know, basically guide the industry and say, here's what you want to do and what you, know, you don't want to do. Some of our colleagues actually have produced such guidelines. And you don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater. You don't want to get rid of, you know, totally of diversification. You don't want to get rid of active investors. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that you, you have to discuss. And that's a more general theme. You have to anticipate, you have to give guidelines. And, you know, intervening exposure is, is fine, but it's often too late and too slow. Um, another topic you are familiar with is, of course, MFNs. You know, the best price guarantees, which is this wonderful invention, which, by the way, is not new, but <laughs> this wonderful invention of platforms which can tax their competitors. That's one of the rare cases I know uh, where you can tax your own competitor. Um, so, you know, Stefan and, and the team arranged for you an hotel in Toulouse. <laughs> now, Toulouse is actually not a good example because Emmanuel Macron, when he was finance minister, got rid of the MFNs. So you're going to New York next, uh, next week, and you're looking for an hotel in New York, in some neighborhood. And you go to Booking.com. Booking.com offers you good service. Uh, tells you, here are the hotels, have most of the hotels. And by, by the way, you'll get the best price with me because I've asked those hotels to give me the best price. They cannot charge a lower price elsewhere or on their website. Wonderful, right? As a consumer, you love that. You get all the hotels at the best price. How can you complain? It's wonderful. OK, but then think about it. Booking.com goes and see the hotels and say, I have unique customers. Those people don't search elsewhere. They're on my platforms, and they will buy on my platforms. And therefore, therefore, you will have to, if you want to reach those customers, you have to go through booking. And, um, and that's something that uh, you have to pay 25%. I'm, I'm giving a random number. It changes across uh, countries and so on. Give me 25% of the hotel room, otherwise you'll never get to those consumers. Now, the interesting part is the next one. Interesting part is that the 25% are not paid by booking.com customers. Because imagine that booking.com customers have 20% market share. Given that 
this extra cost has to be passed through to consumers, but in a uniform way because of the best price guarantee. You, you cannot charge more to Booking.com customers. Then everybody has to pay. That means 80% of the extra cost is passed through actually to Booking.com rivals, including the hotel's own website. Now, there are also good reasons, and uh, you know, that's another theme. I don't have to talk time to talk about it, but that's, uh, there's a good reason, actually also for those most favored nation clauses. So how do you deal with that? And you know, they're, they're, they are bad, but they have a rationale too. So you need to you know, be a good economist and work on how to regulate that. And by the way, it's everywhere. I, talk, I don't mean to say anything about <laughs> bad about Booking.com in particular. Amazon has been doing that all the time. All the platforms do that. And I can tell you the personal assistant you have in your bedroom uh, are just about that, which is that they, you know, please, uh, you know, Google Home, please uh, call me uh, call me a doctor, 25%, <laughs> you know, whatever. This is what's going to happen. So here you are. And you need, we economists, everybody in the room has to design solutions to that. So let me talk a little bit about data ownership, and then we can go on with that. Um, we have GDPR in Europe. It's a good first step, but not that great. I'm very critical of GDPR. And by the way, it hasn't been done in collaboration with uh, competition authorities. And in terms of pricey, it doesn't change things that much. I, I love the goals pursued by GDPR. And it has the merit of existing when it doesn't exist in other countries. However, there are big, big issues with that. Um, let me talk a little bit. I, I don't have time to talk about all those things. So let me talk a little bit about an ongoing debate on which we don't have a solution since we were talking about competition policy. Uh, data as a barrier to entry is going to be big in healthcare and in, in many other things. Now, if you go to Google, uh, you visit Google or Facebook, they will tell you, no, no, I mean, there's a law of large numbers. We have learned the law of large numbers. And you don't really need that many data in, in the end for your service. And that's correct. And there's been a bunch of papers written around, around this theme that actually, because of the large, law of large number, you know, once you have 500 data, maybe you don't need uh, 5,000 or 50,000. Depends. So the opponents, uh, like Posner and Weil, for example, say, "No, no, this is a da this is a picture from their from their um, from their book." Um, basically, say, oh, "Well, maybe you have the law of large number for a given service, but if you want to improve the service and go beyond, uh, then you need very large samples." Another approach is uh, instead of economies of scale, you have economies of scope. So, for example, if you want to search and have a proper search. You need data on, on, um, on uh, keywords, so you, you must really know which keywords are the most popular, but you also need data on the user. Know everything about the user to forward the user to the right website. So you, you know, that's an example in which you also have economies of scope before, between multiple data sets. Now, this is not something we, we know very much about. There is some research going on with that, but uh, we need to know more. Okay. Uh, what's wrong with GDPR? Well, the competition dimension. By the way, the big platforms don't mind GDPR. They love it. Um, the user switching between platforms, th there is one problem which is not addressed. Um, it's difficult if the data transfer is infeasible or time consuming, but it's complex, time intensive, at least for someone like me. <laughs> uh, maybe not for everyone, but uh, it's, it's complex. No technical standard. And you know, one of the things which is important, it's not dynamic. So you know, if, if you're on Facebook and you, you, you post content, you receive content and so on, you want to update it in a dynamic way. You don't, wa you don't want to do it once and for all, <laughs> right? So if you want to multi-home, it's very important. If you switch to another platform, that's okay. Because if you switch from Facebook to another platform, then you, you take your stuff and then that's there. And you start on the other platform. But if you want to multi-home, because you have friends on multiple platforms, including on Facebook, 
you know, you have to update all the time. So that's the kind of thing, you know, it's typical that a law is constructed for getting about important objective in mind. Now, what are users concerned about? You know all of that. Um, so surplus, consumer surplus extraction, they know everything about us so they can extract our willingness to pay. Algorithmic fairness, uh, data dissemination, sometimes it's just fraud, but sometimes it's just that we accept. I don't know about you, but you know, there is, even after GDPR, you have these continuous pop-ups. And this morning, I, wa I, had, I was very much in a hurry <laughs> to come here, and I had to consult some website for, for, for some email I had to send. And of course, you know, I went to a non completely unknown website. They asked me to agree, and I agreed. I don't know what I agreed. But anyway, even if I had looked, I would have spent time, and they, they would tell me they would share that their data with 150 companies, one of them I know, I don't know what their policies are. I mean, it just makes no sense to me. And I click all the time just like before. The only difference is that there are those pop-ups all the time. Um, no, they, are, they, are, they also exploit very carefully our present bias preferences. That, that applies to me as well. I want to know, and I don't want to be interrupted by those things, and so on and so forth. Um, as one of our colleagues has, has worked on Dauchinian and, and, and others, uh, even if you are not giving your consent, your data is still on the web. <laughs> Simply because people post pictures of you, they write about your illness, they do whatever, and they put a lot of content about you. Okay, nothing wrong with that, except that uh, you, cannot, you cannot escape. Now, something I, I really care about is, you know, we, it looks like we are completely schizophrenic with data. You know, I care a lot about privacy and I click all the time without looking yeah, for the reasons I gave earlier. But at the same time, we have reasons to be concerned. We have reason to be concerned that um, about ostracism, discrimination, uh, hatred, fueling, uh, violence, and so on by fellow employees and co-workers, uh, hate mongers, blackmailers, uh, governments. Um, on various topics, he has just uh, some of the topics, and they are very context and non-dependent, of course. Some things are fine in a country in a given point of time, but not fine later on or earlier on or, or in, uh, in another country. So things like abortion, sexual orientation, politics, religion, and so on. There are many, many examples of that where the issue is divisive, and it's bound to, to create conflicts and that's something we, we need to, to think about. Now, what's wrong with GDPR on this track is that we need serious regulation. The analogy I will give for that is banking and f food safety. So I don't know, imagine yourself, you put your savings in, in, in bank. Imagine you have no regulator. What will you do? You will have to, assuming you have the data, you'll have to look at the off balance sheet and balance sheet activities of your bank every evening to know whether you're going to withdraw your money. Well, good luck. Even if you, even if you have expertise, there is no way you could do that. And that would be terribly inefficient too, right? Um, so uh, we, need, we have regulators for that. And same thing when, when you go to the MOI tonight, you are not going, all, any, all of you are not going to check the, f the, the food chain that has led to your, to your menu, right? Fortunately, you have other things to do, right? So, you know, at some point, um, you need regulation. And, you know, I think one of the things we have to do is to work on some, some standardized default option that, um, that are familiar to the users. Um, this is, in the making, but it, the point I want to make here, the message is that we just cannot stick with, uh, stay with GDPR. We have to go way, way beyond GDPR. Finally, let me mention something I'm working on, and I should have a paper on that uh, in a month from now. Come two months. Um, 
So we have witnessed a huge amount of innovation, which has made the cost of collecting, storing, and anal analyzing data very close to zero. The marginal cost of all those things has, has gone down tremendously. Some people think uh, that it's going to promote trust and a more civilized society. And why not? You know, the, you know, where the social score pilots have been deployed in China, uh, people drive slower. They, res they, they respect the pedestrian crossing. They pollute less. That's great. Right, that's, that's great. But there is also the concern that um, it might lead to a mass surveillance by platform and governance holding and integrating too much information about what makes us an individual. So we are at this juncture of the technology with all those great innovation where this technology comes to maturity. And that's really a concern about what's going to happen with this. And there is a concern in particular that in the construction of things like so social score, which by the way, are not Chinese specificities. Don't believe it's a Chinese specificity. China is more advanced technologically and also has a regime which is a little bit more conducive to that. But it's going to be all over the place. But the problem is that with it comes a threat, which is that on top of the nice d dimensions of behavior, like driving carefully in, in Toulouse, you do also have the possibility of bundling various aspects of your life, which the government is trying to impose upon you. That may be politics, that may be religion, that may be social norms, things that the government wants to, to behave. Like, you know, a way of uh, life behavior, in particular all in those divisive issues I, I was talking about. And that can be made even worse by guilt by association. Now we have facial recognition, it's working very, very well. So if you walk with me in the street this afternoon, you'll be seen with, with me, and people will know we are corresponding. You know, you don't need AI analysis of our emails and our posts. Facial recognition is also very able to do that. So dr drawing the social graph of people has become very easy. So you can also use social graph to impose ostracism on the people who adopt behavior which a government doesn't like. And finally, it's not only autocratic governments. It's also uh, democratic governments where a majority is trying to impose its value on minorities. It's also the private sector. You have to do a reinterpretation for that, but think about large platform. In that case, they, the large platforms can actually influence politics. It's not new that already exists with the media, but now the platform have very strong power. So if you are a politician, and you start talking about regulating those public utilities as public utilities, breaking them up, and forcing higher antitrust, and forcing taxes, and so on, then the platforms can also punish the politicians by selecting the news and the pictures about this politician. It's not new, that has always existed. And that's why many uh, buy media for that. But you know, this is getting very strong. So, the platforms themselves also can do lots of bad things with technologically wonderful things. So that's something I don't have time to talk about, but I, I feel pretty strongly about. So, you know, so we could talk about the future of labor, about industrial policy, and many other things. Advertising, of course. <laughs> now, I have the platform. I still have the platform for a few minutes. Uh, I abuse my market power. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, we, we have time for questions or? 
Just raise your hand and I'll send the mic around. Start in, in the back. Maybe you want to introduce yourself? Hi, thank you. I'm Filippo Lanciari from the University of Chicago. I didn't understand if your main recommendation was about uh, for antitrust policy, was just inverting the burden of proof in mergers, or if you have something more specific to say about that? I was wondering what your thoughts are. Well, I'm very much in favor of uh, producing guidelines and business review letters and the like, so, and, and sandboxes as well, actually. So um, try to make it clear using economic analysis what is allowed and what is not allowed at any given point of time, <coughs> knowing that we may be wrong. We may make mistakes and we'll react to it. As you know, one of my favorite examples is what was done at DOJ in the 90s. Uh, there was no patent pools anymore. Patent pools is when you put uh, several firms, put their patents together to market them to the implementers. And they were at the time a Berkeley economist at the DOJ, and they actually pushed for uh, the, re you know, the reintroduction of patent pools, which covered all industries, or most industries before World War II, but had disappeared. And what they did is they basically, uh, I don't remember exactly the timing in terms of the interaction with industry, but they said, you know, patent pools are fine if you have condition X, Y, and Z, like independent licensing and a bunch of other things. And of course, we later on, we worked on uh, trying to see whether those were good condition, adding some condition, whatever. But you know, the, the, those economists, had, uh, I think, did a wonderful job because they enable uh, the, the building up of patent pools, which had disappeared. And that was very reactive, in a sense. But of course, you know, it's a business regulator. It's not a law. So we learn by doing. We try to use economic instruments, uh, thinking to, to guide, actually, those business regulators. Uh, more generally, you know, same thing. You know, if you talk about you know, common ownership or MSNs. You know, we need to tell the industry, oh, okay, this sounds fine if you do X, Y, and Z. And that's, that's the way to go, I think. Um, you know, after that, you know, if you, if you think about what has been done on um, fair access in Europe, I haven't studied the cases in detail, but about fair access in Europe, there are issues, yes, there are big issues. The incumbents may abuse their power. Um, at the same time, those things took a long, long time. And of course, if you're an entrant, basically you have disappeared by the time you know, the decision is made. It's still, use, it's still useful as a deterrence mechanism, but you know, it's not perfect. So I don't have the answers to all those things, but my, my view is that we must adapt to this new age. You know, our tools are too slow. And one of the things you can do is also to give guidelines. And accept the fact that you may be wrong or you may have to adjust your policy, but it gives some legal certainty, at least in the short run, to those firms. And, you know, see what they can do and cannot do. Well, it's not perfect. Yes, thank you very much for this very inspiring presentation. So I'm Sebastien Soriano, the, the head of RCEP, the French telecom regulator. Um, I, I have a question uh, regarding your recommendations uh, about how to improve competition policy, uh, specifically on one point. So uh, as you know, there have been a report made to the European Commission about how to improve uh, 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 competition in the digital field. And there one was a, one idea in this report about data interoperability. So this is something you have not uh, uh, directly mentioned in your presentation. I understand that what you said about the ability of businesses to multi-home may be part of it, but in the same time, the idea of interoperability could open uh, the option to help competitors of the platform itself to enter the market by uh, uh, redistributing the network effects 
And in your presentation, I've seen um, rather yeah. elements about competition for the market yeah. rather than competition in the market. So uh, can we understand from your presentation that you are not an absolutely fan of data interoperability? Um, or I'm <laughs> am I wrong? No, no, Question no, about no, data no, interoperability. I, I, there, are, there are a couple of remarks. I'm not, I'm not against at all. The first remark is that if it's done, it has to be done by a regulator. The incumbents are not going to do it. It's not like startup setting where you have enough people and they have common interests somehow, I and mean they have divergent interests, but it's not quite the same, and here you already have incumbents. Incumbents also create a problem because you know, Google and Facebook may take you to court and say you are expropriating my data. You know, I've paid for them, and you know, with uh, all those uh, free services, I've lost money for a while, and now you prevent me from using those data. But definitely, we need to have some data interoperability, but we need standards for that, and that will come from the regulator. We, honestly, I skip this part because we, we, we are not quite sure what the best regime is. So, you know, the current thing about data ownership is um, that it's a service for data arrangement now. Um, you know, you, you have no data collection, that's an alternative. Uh, you might be throwing the baby with the bathwater. Not con contextual advertising, that you can keep. Actually, if you look at DuckDuckGo, that's how they make their money, the search engine DuckDuckGo, which doesn't collect data, but can still have contextual <coughs> advertising. Um, compensate users through micropayments, I, somehow, I don't know, but uh, I don't quite believe that. Because, you know, they could give us micropayments. Um, you have to make sure there are, there are no bots, of course. You know, <laughs> whenever you have micropayments, you'll have bots which will be pretending to be real users. Um, and then you have to figure out what is the value to the, to the firm and, and the cost for yourself. And, you know, I have, I have enough of those pop-ups, but if on top of that I have to set a price for giving my data, it's, it's, uh, it's just totally impossible. Um, and the data come from multiple sources. I mean, there are lots of things. People say we need intermediaries, but then you add one more layer and uh, one more uh, tax along the way, I don't know. Um, people talk about data trust, and I'm going to come to that. Um, the, it's true that data is the ultimate public good in a sense, and that's what you're getting at. Um, the problem is what do you do? I mean, there are several primes. B I'm not going to talk about price here, because you will have to give your consent, of course. Well, if it's a medical fine, that's fine. You know, a medical fine is easy, because you know, I'm going to see a doctor, and I decide whether I w this doctor can, sh can have the file, medical, my medical file, that's fine. But in general, for other things, they are to, to basically uh, do this. Um, some people have proposed, uh, it's a topic I know pretty well, uh, that there will be some kind of friend licensing. So Google has lots of data, you don't want to expropriate those data, and then you get some friend licensing. Um, not easy, right? The last part, you know, it's something, uh, I would say, I should not answer to that because we need to do much more research on that. We need to do much, much more research on that. We are pretty weak. We don't like the status quo, but you know, the alternatives are not great at this stage. So what do we do? One thing I'm sure of is that you need to have a level playing field. So take, for example, banking. Uh, banking, uh, we have PSD2 in Europe. So the banks have to share their data about creditors, and, 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 and all, not only about creditors, but also about their customers. Um, fine, that may increase competition. But then, who is going to share? Is Google going to share their data, which are not the same data at all? They are not banking data with Société Générale, right? Ah, in principle, the law says it's possible, but I don't believe it's going to happen. Now, but then, the GAFAs will have a field there, right? We know that data which not, are not banking data are crucial for banking. Just take and financial in China. And financial 
is one of the top seven companies in the world. I mean, Alibaba is one of the top seven companies in the world and has become a banker overnight, lending to millions of SMEs. It's very, it's very interesting for those who don't know. You know how long it, it, it takes to apply for a loan to your, for your company? It's three seconds. And you, you know how long it takes to get the answer? One second. There is no single employee involved. And it's profitable, they make money on that. Now, what's going on? And Financial, Alibaba, has data about how those firms behave in e-commerce, ratings, has data about the people themselves, you know, their managers, <laughs> has lots of zillions of data. And those data are very good at predicting whether the loans are going to be reimbursed or not. They have no, they have a little bit of banking data, but it's not, that's not the thing. So here we are, you know, Google has data about your health too, and so on and so forth. So that's the question is, how do you define who is going to have access to data and whether those who have access to other data on everything uh, will have to, to give their data. It's very unlikely. And that's one of the things we should research. I don't have the answer at all to your question, but this is the kind of thing we need to conduct research on. And that's going to be true for, for this, it's going to be true for healthcare, for, for everything actually. Hello, uh, my name is Bruno Libaber. I'm leading the Center on Regulation in Europe, CER. Um, thank you very much for your speech. So it was a treat to listen to you. I'd like to come back on, on the concept of sandboxing, sandbox regulation. We at CER have been uh, advocating for a very long time already the, the, the necessity for regulators to be flexible to deal with changing uh, business models and, and evolutionary technology. But the, we, we are faced when we, when we talk to that, uh, about that to our, for instance, to regulators, they say, yeah, but we are in a di dilemma because on the one hand, it's clear that we have to learn as, as all of us are, are learning, we are, as institutions have to learn, have, exp have to experiment. But on the other end, our regulatees, and in particular, those who are in need for regulation, we're not talking about the, the, the big platform, we're talking about the, the licorne, the, the, the ones who want to take up, they tell us, please provide us with a stable legal and regulatory environment. So how do you reconcile uh, a stable legal and regulatory environment with the concept of sandboxing? Thank no, you. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, there's no, no way of reconciling in a sense because the reason why you want sandboxes is that you have a very fast changing environment in which a stable, a stable legal environment is not going to be appropriate anyway. Uh, but I also see the point that you, if you, you commit investments, you, know, you, you want to know what's going to happen. And, you know, it's easier in more stable industries, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just very difficult. I'm not an expert on sandboxes as, at all, but, you know, in other areas of public policies, we try in a region or we try in a city to see what happens. Um, why not? But you have to, I, I, I buy your point, you have to be very careful and think about whether it's a good thing in this particular instance. You have to be careful, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we, uh, we have to stop here and thank Jean very much for uh, his really interesting talk and uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be millions of other questions but we, we have to go on with the program. So okay. thank you very much, Jean. It's well, thank you very really much. Pleasure. Thank you.